Join. Join. Come, 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 Apart from his work on chimneys and spires, Fred Dibner has devoted his life to steam. Over a period of 20 years, he rebuilt one steam engine and got well on the way with another. Now, as his 50th birthday approached, he had achieved the ambition he had cherished from youth, this great steam-driven workshop in his backyard. Put together from scrap and the surviving parts of Victorian machines, the workshop now had the capacity to restore whole fleets of steam engines and to serve the Fred Dibners of the future, if there are any, for centuries to come. At the same time, Fred had by no means neglected over the years the improvement of the family quarters. Since you were last here, like, I bought my house off the Earl of Bradford. This character rung up from Cambridge and said, you know, we're coming up to uh, have a chat with you, you see. And Mr... just forgotten his name, but he liked to look at your steam engines. And I thought, ah, oh, and then Cambridge, you see, the <clears throat> big steam men down there, you know. <laughs> And they, they would come uh, up and I'll impress them with my steam engines and then I'll get a bit knocked off price at those. Anyway, up they came and, you know, it happened to be raining that day so we didn't bother going to work and we had steamroller taking over in the shed and this man from Cambridge appeared to be quite impressed and said, well, how much will you give me? Well, in the, you know, for the, this here house, you see and I wandered around showing him all the bad points, so there's a nine-inch bulge on the back, you know, and it's a bloody wonder it's not all in the river, you see. Um, and a bit of time went by, and cutting a long story short, like, we, we got it for £5,000, and all this land and everything, you know, uh, and so now it's up to me to, you know, stop the bloody thing slipping into the river. Right, next one, Donald. Mm. You don't fall off the... No. You've got the square bit out the middle. Well, very... It don't matter, really. No. I just keep screwing. It'll move out. Hmm. Right. Oh, that's it. Beautiful. Mm. I should hold it up. When we first came, you know, the, the were a, noticed this great nasty bulge on the back, you know, and I thought, oh, I know why they've let me have this cheap, you know, <laughs> sort of the bloody back's going to fall out. And then one day, I think I was lying in bed and there were one hell of a bang. And I thought, that's it, the backs fell out, the outside four and a half fell out of the bloody place. And I were under a bit of a misapprehension, it was actually a gas explosion, you know. Like, the wife come running upstairs screaming, <laughs> no eyebrows, <laughs> a big hole burnt in front of her dress. <laughs> bloody gas gooker had blown up. <laughs> Hitherto, Fred had regarded his domain merely as a shelter for his steam engines and his family. Now he began to feel pride in its possession and its idyllic situation. 
My house is sort of just over there behind all them trees. Like in between there and here, there's the river. And then this, of course, is the cemetery, you know, where we'll all end up eventually. Um, in here, actually, somewhere, there's the, the first and I think only man in Bolton to be killed by a lion. It seems that, that they'd not quite got the preparations right. Like they, they got this big cage at the local Wakes Week thing in 1890 summer. And the. the um, they had these braziers with big long iron rods, you see, and somebody forgot to light the bloody fires, you know. <laughs> anyway, the lion got the man, and there no iron rods, red hot iron rods, for get them off him, and so it, he ended up in here, poor fella, you know. And then my dad used to tell me a tale about they had a big flood once, and it washed one or two of them down the river, you know, like the corpses there is. The thing is that. You know, I don't, whether there's any truth in it or not, I don't know, but I know down in that riverbed there, there's all, all sorts of gravestones. Like, when my time comes, you know, I, I think you, you couldn't really find a more peaceful and nicer cemetery than this, you know, it's nice and quiet, you know, they cut the grass regularly. Um, not that you'd notice, like, when you're six foot under, but it's uh, much nicer than um, being turned into a little plastic bag or a tin can full of fag ash, isn't it? And sort of besides that, I wouldn't mind building my own gravestone, you know, like make one like a chimney with a staging round the top, you know, lightning conductor on and everything. Um, very fancy, you know, and with a beautiful fancy top on it. place is getting a bit overcrowded now and like we decided that we'd build a new wing on it you see and so the thing is with it being a listed building everything's got to look just right and so you've got to have second hand bricks so we, we've, we've, after many a month of looking round at second hand bricks and various buildings that were about to have the big hammer uh, we found these about ten houses in one row and six of them had never been messed about with they'd never been pointed or anything and the bricks were perfect, you see, a perfect match for the existing ones. So we went with two Land Rovers, the wife, me, Donald, and father-in-law, and another lad, and we literally took the front out of six of them and brought it back here to, to build the place out of. And then it's got a, the lad who did the drawings got carried away, you see, with all this fancy stonework, you know, and stone's expensive stuff, and we had another windfall. We met this vicar who said, you know, I've got all these gravestones here, like, you know, you can have them if you'll shift them. And uh, so, you know, there now are the winder heads, the mullions and the winder bottoms. The thing is that, you know, I'm a bit worried in case the bloody place will be haunted when it's finished. <laughs> mm. Mm. That's it, That's is it? it. Mm. Oh, do you think we'll get it off him, Lonnie, you know? I don't know, I think I'll, I'll have a word with him. I'll, I'll probably see him tonight anyway, I'm doing a job mm. for this guy here. Yeah. When I came up last time, um, I spotted it in the garden. Yeah. I didn't say anything to him then. Yeah. But, uh, but that's the one, it's it's, perfect. Yeah, it'll be just right. Proportions, won't it, for top of the yeah, lens? Yeah, could do with mm. two of them, really. Well, there's another one somewhere. Yeah. You think we can get it off him? Oh, I think so, right. because I know the guy who owns this place. Yeah. And he... He's a teacher, you see. Yeah. And I know that he liked to. He, in fact, he mentioned he liked to bring yeah. the kids down to your yard to see the oh. to see the engine, you see. So mm. I can work a deal in. Mm. But if he brings the kids down, if, yeah. if you if feel that you have his stone ball, mm. then uh, sort of mm. payment, if you yeah. like. Yeah, I'm game with me, isn't it? Hey. Okay. Yeah. This is where the Tarzan act comes in, eh? <laughs> this is the one. Right, then. Yeah. Keep going. 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 Keep yeah. Uh, oh, it's terrific, isn't it? Yeah, a lot better than the other thing. Uh, 
Let's go downstairs and have a, you know, have a Look view at across of the it. road. Yeah. Don't think it'll blow away so easy, will it? Every summer when the children were young, Fred and Alison made the epic journey at a stately four miles an hour to a steam rally at Chelford in Cheshire. Like a steam engine, really, gives you sort of a form of immortality to actually resurrect one from a pile of rust. You know, you've got your stamp on it. The thing is, you know, when I'm long gone dead, you know, it'll still be here and, you know, I mean, even if they drop the bomb, they'd have blow all the houses down but just roll this over into a ditch somewhere and some, if there were anybody left, would eventually find it and sort of say, mm, you know, this is an interesting piece, you know, like, what were they like when they made these? <laughs> You've got to have a very good wife, if you have a steam engine, that understands, you know. When I got married, things were a bit rough as far as steam engines were concerned, and divorce proceedings were imminent on quite a lot of occasions. But as the years roll by, like Alice and my wife has gotten more liking to the thing... I have a good mother, <laughs> and she used to help me a lot. <laughs> Oh, and we had no money, because something was bought for the engine. And I was always all right to go and get food off her if she'd fetch me something round. And she'd, you know, see that the kids were all right for clothes, and then my sisters used to fetch me clothes for them. The steam men with the engines, very few of them are married. They just think that women and steam engines don't mix at all, and they tend to look down on any wife that arrives. They think that you might try and get them to get rid of their engines, which has happened. I decided when Lorna was 18 months, there was too many drunken men coming round, so it was either the children and me, or else the drunken men, and the children won. We got rid of all the drunken men, and the girls ended up in the coal bunker, and, and it was a victory for family life. Come on, we're here. You can get out now. Yeah, that way. Well, no, we have a friend, Eric Marshall, who, who's He's on sort his road, of... Eric. He, he, he grows radishes. Right, nice bloke he is. And he's... <laughs> <laughs> he was calling the Radish King, so he got his own back on this fella. He filled his bloody coal bunker up with radishes <laughs> on the top. <laughs> Where's your dad? Have you seen him? Where have we lost him? Bloody thing would do about 70 mile an hour, you know, wouldn't right. he? Going along motorway one That's day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he, he set fire to a field, caused about three motor car crashes, burned a power supply down to a village. When they caught up with him 70 mile further on, he said, it weren't me. <laughs> <laughs> we had some fun down here, there's no doubt about it. Jim Boston. 
Yeah, poor old Jim him. hadn't yeah, gone now. Yes. He was there, and we had a few yobbles around it, yeah, you know. Yeah, we had some fun. That and uh, they were getting Jim's back up a little mm. bit, like, and they said, We're going to get on this engine and drive. Mm. And now Jim says, yeah. No, you're not. Mm. And he was about 73 or 4 yes, then, he wasn't was, he? Yeah. I had a finger missing, yeah, didn't he? That's that's right. Right. Had a bit of an accident. That was with an engine. Flywheel and oil. No, he had it in a chaff. I know, until he stood on his engine there, you know, and these lads were. You know, yes, we're getting on, they started, and you just got off the fire shovel, and he went, bang, <laughs> bang, on both of them. And they carried, the ambulance men come and carried them off. I forgot to fetch my vegetable knife from home. You can't remember everything. He backs the engine up the field, top gear, like the clappers, straight through this gate. Well, when you got through this gate, you had to take a right sharp hand turn, like this. And yeah. Anyway, he gets back as a go. He steers me, didn't make it, and they went straight into a battery house. <laughs> Bloody hell! <laughs> it ends everywhere. It ends everywhere. It did. <laughs> yeah, I'll never forget it. Have you a minute? Yeah, all right. Well, pull mattress off the shelf and put it on. Right, pull <laughs> washing up, pull laundry, be all right. They're all wet. Are they? Yeah. Oh, bad. Yeah, well. Just leave the bucket there till it stops dripping. Well, there's two drips. There's one straight yeah. on the big bed and on the camp. Well, put the bowl on the other one. Well, I've got the bowl with, with water for the potatoes. Oh, what about that bucket there? Well, it's... Oh, it don't leak. All right. Yeah. I was just thinking how dirty it was to go. Oh, it'll be all right. Well, it's better dirty than wet, isn't off, it? Bag off. Well, the sun stops shining, isn't it? It'll be right Don't tomorrow. Worry, lad. We're not worried. He's doing this ground a bit of good. <laughs> Making bloody grass grow. <laughs> <laughs> the only this the only way, Fred, you can find out where your caravan le yeah, roof yeah, leaks. Yeah, when right it's over my bloody bed, it is. Not fair. Well, it depends which side you get on the missus, doesn't it? Yeah, no, she sleeps on her own on the oh. floor. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. For Alison, the pleasure of steam rallies was beginning to wear thin. As the years went by, her thoughts turned increasingly to sunnier vacations, beyond the range of Fred's roller. I ask him every year. I've said every year, I would like a holiday, Fred. <laughs> and he wouldn't like a holiday. Other wives go on holiday, so why can't I? What Alison had in mind was this sort of thing, a holiday abroad. Greece or somewhere similar, and that was the snag. Fred had been abroad once when he was in the army, and he didn't like it. Well, in Greece, really, there's nothing there for a man like me, I shouldn't think. I believe, like, there's some decent buildings look at, but I just couldn't bear lying there on the bloody sand all day, you know, and watching the sunshine. Um, it isn't really my style. They're a bit vain, people who get like that, aren't they? You know, they've, they've got a bloody lie there in the sun so that when they come back to grotty old England where the sun never shines, you know, everybody will think, where on earth have they been? You know, they must have been abroad, you know. It's all one-upmanship, isn't it? Um, the holiday job, really. With each passing summer, Alison's thoughts turned to the golden beaches of the travel brochures. Now, at last, she was determined to take the plunge. Oh, well, me and the girls are going to Greece this year for a holiday. I've waited 18 years and we're going. We're going to enjoy ourselves, get sunburnt. Um, Fred, of course, we'll be going to Stockport to an engine rally. Um, he'll enjoy it Ooh. and I'll enjoy my holiday. <laughs> well, he is grown up now. He'll do all right. He says he can cook eggs and chips. Uh, we'll be all right for drinks, as long as he remembers he's got the kettle on. Uh, <laughs> I just booked and told him, and when he started complaining, I went and paid for the holiday. He's very upset about it. In fact, it's making him ill. <laughs> That's what he is. But I'm still going on holiday. <laughs> <laughs>
Rain came with a vengeance today. Thunderstorms brought flooding to several main roads, in places up to two feet deep. Fire Brigade had many calls from householders. Some people had to paddle to work. their arrival back from Greece, they, they like informed me that, uh, you know, they want a divorce, like, you know, and sort of, they don't like the world of steam engines and factory chimneys. Like, the, I don't know why, because the bloody chimneys have kept us alive for 18 years, you know, and life really at this moment in time, well, it, it, it had got to a stage where we, you know, could more or less semi-retired, you know, like, now it looks as though... I've got to get a mortgage and work for another 18 years, you know, to buy Alison a house and fix her up in the style that, you know, she's been come accustomed to. Fred began to muster his assets, including, regretfully, his 1927 AJS motorbike. The same machine, around about 1924, but with an overhead valve engine, won the Isle of Man TT. Yeah, made when England made the best motorbikes in the world. Not so no more. I once went to Leeds on this, you know. <laughs> yeah. Hell of a deal, over Blackstone Edge, you know. <laughs> it, bloody winter and all. Yeah, my hands were frozen to handlebars. Until 1969, I rode it for 10 years every day, you know, when I, when I first started steeplejacking. Used to take the ladders on the wagon and go to work on this, you see. And, like, I always knew it was worth a bob or two, right? Well, now that I'm a bit desperate for money, it looks as though it's going to go. A great pity, really. But I suppose, like, they have an auction with Sotheby's, you know, it'll be... Uh, get two lunatics bidding against each other, we'll be right, we might make a couple of grand. It, it was a shame, really. It, it, it's one of the few things I've had part with that I really liked. Uh, and, you know, we got the thing there and there were a hell of a crowd. In fact, there were that many people there, you couldn't move hardly. And, and I got £1,700. It were knocked down at 1700 quid to uh, a man from Macclesfield. Um, and uh, I'll weigh that into the Building Society for the war efforts. Uh, you know, that's a, I'll not see any of it, but at least it'll help with the payments. Um, and all, and sort of, I, I went away with the engine the other Friday to open a solid fuel shop at Bury, and when I come back, she'd moved on. Left alone with his thoughts, Fred came to see the stress of the celebrity business as one cause of their domestic troubles. <laughs> People have said to me, like, well, you look right out of place when you were doing that. And I've actually felt right out of place while I've been doing it. Um, like, bloody glamorous grandmother competition. What the hell do I know about glamorous grandmothers, you know? Like, <laughs> um, not really my scene. I don't think they like me. Yeah, I don't think they like me, Jackson. 
get stuck in. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, the bloody pressure of it all, it gets a bit too much. I don't think Alison was a, a person who liked excessive pressure. You know, she was more um, the person who were quite content for sit there watching telly and, you know, just go out and do the things she wanted to do. Um, without having all this extra load thrust on her back, because yeah. there is no doubt whatsoever she were a good help to me. I was asking who they are. 